This is Duke University. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Erin Worsham, I am the Executive Director of CASE, and on behalf of the CASE team, I'm very excited to welcome you here tonight for what will be a fantastic speaker and event. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with CASE, we are the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, a research and education center based here at the Fuqua School of Business. Uh, we have a mission of preparing leaders and organizations with the business tools needed to achieve lasting social change. So over the years, we've been around 11 years now. We have, which is crazy, but 11 years of, of case, um, the, those tools and business skills have, some of them have remained constant over those 11 years, but some of them have changed and evolved. And one of those areas that we have really found that has evolved and become a critical piece of the social impact toolkit is impact investing. So in September of 2011, we launched Case I3, the Case Initiative on Impact Investing, to make us focus on that topic and help to develop the field and develop our students to learn more about impact investing and how they can have an impact in their careers. So none of that would be possible without Professor Kathy Clark, who was the founder of Case I3 and the current director of the program. So let me just take a, a minute to <laughs> sing her praises before I stop talking and then let us get to the business of why you all are here. Um, in addition to being the director of Case I3, Kathy is also an adjunct professor of social entrepreneurship and impact investing here at Fuqua. She is a, a practitioner and a scholar, so she's managed foundation and private funds. She's advised and consulted with and sat on the boards of a variety of organizations in this field, including B-Lab and Gears, Investor Circle, and many, many more. And she's also written extensively on impact investing and social entrepreneurship. But more than that, she's an amazing colleague and just a wonderful friend. So with that, I will stop and pass it over to her to introduce our speaker and get us started. Thank you. It's the nicest introduction I've ever had. Oh, I'm so glad we can repeat that every time. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hear it again. Um, so. Uh, Thank you, Erin, um, who is an amazing executive director for our 11-year-old program, and you know we're excited about the, the coming years. Um, one of our favorite activities as part of Case I3 is bringing practitioners to campus so that we can learn about what they do and their perspectives on the field. Um, and in addition to um, the uh, work that we do here in our coursework and our research, um, I was telling Lori about our Case I-3 Fellows and Associates program and that now we have close to 40 students um, working in teams doing um, a lot of what Lori's team does, uh, consulting um, to impact uh, uh, investors uh, and entrepreneurs around the globe. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to invite Lori um, as our fourth official Case I-3 speaker in the series um, as CEO of Include. Um, I also wanted to mention another reason that we invited her, um, which has to do with um, uh, some work that we released recently. Many of you probably have seen our Impact Investing 2.0 research report that we put out last month. Um, it's a, it, it was based, it's based on a study of um, high-performing impact investing funds around the globe. Um, and what we found from that research is that many of those deals have required third parties to come in and really understand the strategic objectives of different stakeholders, um, and that that requires what we're calling multilingual leadership. It means you have to speak philanthropy, you have to speak finance, you have to speak policy, and you have to be able to knit together those things. And oftentimes it's the intermediaries, the third parties, who can come together and actually make something work. Um, there aren't that many firms in the world that do this really, really well all over the world and include is one of the best. So I am thrilled um, to have uh, Lori here because she is truly a multilingual leader. She has recently overseen the merger of two leading organizations, Shorebank International, which she ran for almost 10 years, is that right? Six. Six, okay. <laughs> um, and Triados Facet, and I'm sure she'll talk tonight about what the opportunity is that they saw about blending two different functions um, into one organization. She's also spent her career all over the world. She's worked in nine countries. She speaks four languages. 
I get by. You get by. I bet she's better than that. Uh, providing legal and business advisory services to help clients um, and partners design, connect, finance, and build solutions um, towards positive social and environmental outcomes. Um, I'm really hoping that she's going to tell us some of her success stories and maybe some of her lessons um, from her experience along the way. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. I love being called multilingual. That was really nice. <laughs> it's not true, but in your, in, I loved your definition of the multilingual. No. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy uh, my opportunities to come to sessions like this and to get out of my own day-to-day -day reality and intensity and sometimes narrowness of focus, even though we think we're very broad in what we're doing, and to engage with folks like yourselves who come from a variety of backgrounds and have a real passion and commitment to the conversation about impact. And I walked over with Vineet tonight, and it was a, a nice stroll through. I, I live in London, so the rain was very familiar for me. I even had my umbrella. Vineet was impressed. I had my umbrella and my boots. Very, I always prepared when you're a Londoner. And uh, it was just nice to stroll through the campus, uh, have a conversation with Vineet, and you did really feel the commitment, the interest, and the passion on how we can tap our multiple skills and talents for greater positive change and impact. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention, and maybe some of you know this and maybe some of you don't, Nelson Mandela passed away just a few hours ago. And uh, I'm sure for all of us, um, uh, really pause and, and, and it touches each one of us probably in different ways. Um, for me, uh, Nelson Mandela has always been a beacon, uh, a light, a guidepost, and a source of inspiration. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing to even think about the world without the gift of Nelson Mandela here with us. So I think he does offer some inspiration even for this conversation tonight. Um, someone with courage, conviction, energy, sense of humor, <laughs> uh, and puts so much of himself into trying to create a better place for all of us. So I just did want to mention that. Uh, and Clude, and our name is new. We're still getting used to it ourselves. And Clude, it's only one month old. We are dedicated to building a more inclusive global economy, but through the lens of local economies. So it's all about inclusivity in local economies. And for us, we believe that you can't have sustainable, long-term resilient economies if they are not inclusive and participatory. When we say inclusivity, we don't mean financial inclusion alone, although that's quite important. So providing credit, savings, insurance, and other financial products that really meet the needs of people affordably and reliably, a very important part of inclusivity. But we also mean things like connecting smallholder farmers with markets for their products that are recognized and valued and they receive appropriate remuneration for those products. Making sure that dairy processors in different locations have the benefit of breakthroughs in technologies. Using mobile platforms to connect rural communities not just with financial means but also education healthcare, and other information sources for greater empowerment. So for us, the theme to our work is all about inclusivity that can lead to more sustainability. Uh, I, I think what's interesting about being in a room like this is that we're like-minded. Um, you, you've all chosen to be here, not just tonight, but you've chosen this program. You've chosen to put a lot of your time and energy and effort, because I know it is, does take a lot of effort. Vineet was explaining to me uh, the intensity, I mean, the good in a positive way, but the intensity of the experience. But you've made that choice. And so we're having a conversation where certain things are kind of taken for granted in our conversation. And there's a certain comfort that comes from that, a certain um, just warmth and feeling, which is wonderful. But I would encourage us not to feel too comfortable because there are, in my work, what I encounter, a lot of people outside these walls and this beautiful campus who, I would say, um, don't quite understand yet what we mean when we talk about impact, impact investing, uh, businesses for positive impact, uh, not a little skepticism, but worse, and this is the real danger, there are people out there who actually think this is a fad. They think it's a precious silo. They think this is some nice new jargon, but it doesn't really have the robustness to serve us in the long term. And so I think one of the challenges and one of the opportunities, and I applaud Professor Clark for galvanizing people from outside to come into this room, is that we do need to build alliances. I mean, we've known each other now for several years. We need to have those alliances and to ensure that we are reaching out and trying to not only to explain, but also to demonstrate what we mean by this 
work and through this work. So comfortable tonight, but let's not be too comfortable as we, as we go forward. Um, so I think the real theme that I want to touch upon tonight, and I'll do it in two ways, is how do we push beyond uh, the, the language, some of the ideas and the thoughts and the, the demonstrations of what's possible to really show there's an enduring approach, there's a lasting and enduring approach to growing funding businesses that have a purpose, a purpose to deliver positive environmental, social, and developmental change. How do we push beyond and really ensure that this becomes mainstream? This becomes the way in which we think about business going forward. That's what I think is the ultimate uh, goal and aspiration. I think it's absolutely achievable. So um, I wanted to also give a thank you, not only to Kathy for inviting me, but I really want to give a shout out to the case studies. I have been using them, as I told her already, uh, for due diligence with investors. I've been saying it's one thing for me to talk about something, and because I'm selling in these meetings, but it's another thing to have a, a very well-documented example and articulation of what is going on in Microvest, Bridges and others. So I really applaud the work that you have done because it's, it's your work, but you're shining a spotlight on the work of others, and that's incredibly powerful. So uh, not to ask you to do more, but I'm sure there'll be more, <laughs> uh, more to come. And, it's, and, and what I also really appreciate, appreciate about the case studies, it's the real story. It's the full story. I think sometimes in our conversations, we can just get the headline, right? The, ki the, 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 the Twitter, <laughs> the 130 characters. Uh, the, what's the real message, and we, that's good, but these case studies go much deeper than that and really tell about the journey that these businesses and institutions and asset managers have been on, and I think that's really the powerful part of how you've done this so comprehensively, so a real thank you. And I think this level of engagement and spotlight are critically important at this moment in time for the reasons that, that I just mentioned. So there's a lot of good news. I don't want to suggest there isn't good news. Um, there's uh, tremendous, I would say, interest and buzz about impact investing. The GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, just had its first ever conference in London. They chose the city of London purposefully because they wanted to go to a traditional center of finance. And they had 400 participants, many newcomers to the conversation, many institutional investors in the Guild Hall in the city of London. So quite a, an impressive venue. Uh, I happened to be there and participated on the opening plenary with Luther Reagan, who is the uh, head of the Global Impact Investing Network. And so that, that's great to attract. And it's a, it was a, a, a paid conference, so people had to pay money to come. And there was, I would say, serious engagement um, and conversation and question. Uh, but there are some real gaps that remain between that expression of interest and what we're seeing in terms of transaction execution. And that's what I want to shine a bit of a spotlight on today, this evening. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to tell you just a, f a couple of the gaps that we're seeing through our work and our perspective. And then I did want to share a little bit about our company, just to give you a sense of how we fit in this broader ecosystem. And hopefully, there might be some of you who are interested in the kind of work that we do. And we're always looking to, not that I'm recruiting at the moment, but always looking for people on a project basis or even just in building those alliances, as I'm mentioning, people we can interface with. So that's what I wanted to, uh, to focus on. So the, the three gaps that we're seeing, uh, the first is this gap, as I just alluded to, between articulating an interest in impact and actually writing the check and coming into the deal. And I would go one step further that I think even for those who are coming into deals, there's a gap between the, the, purpose, of the, or the, the purpose of their impact that, they, that they're saying and the actual terms of the transaction they are negotiating. So it's two levels of gap here. And we see it manifest itself in many ways. So going back to that gin example, there were several, and I will not name them, but there were several pension funds and insurance companies in the room. Great that they're there. But they then went on to say quite openly, I might be interested in looking at impact, but at the end of the day, it is a second tier consideration. I am going to look at this through my private equity lens, through my real estate lens, through my public equities lens. I'm going to look at the deal. That's it. And only when I'm convinced I would do this deal no matter what, then I will look as an additive the impact, because that helps me tell a good story about my investment. And again, I don't want to be overly critical of those institutional investors, but they're doing it in two parts. They're not doing it mission first, mission last. They're not doing it embedded in the transaction filtering up front. They are definitely saying we're, 
We're open to impact. We'd like to have more impact in our portfolio, but only if the transaction meets our standard criteria, which are defined in a quite narrow way, quite a one-dimensional way, and then we'll look at impact secondly. So there is there's a real gap there. I would also pinpoint that, in my view, one of the areas where we have to do more outreach and education are the gatekeepers. The advisors to the pension funds, insurance companies, the advisors to high net worth individuals. When you go in, into the city of London or New York or anywhere and you talk to some of the advisors to high net worth, you look at the high net worth surveys, any of the surveys that come out, they express an interest and in impact. When you talk to the advisors, it's impenetrable. There is very much a, 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 oh, I can't do that, I have a fiduciary duty to my client, when in fact the asset owner has indicated through other channels, I'm actually interested in this. So there's a gap there, because, again, between the articulation or the expression of interest and the actual getting deals done. And I, I'm not discouraged by it, it just tells us where we have to focus and do more, and again, not to overstate the emphasis on the case studies, but having tangible evidence now, having demonstrated transactions, celebrating those, pointing to those. It's not just a hope and a promise, we actually have real business to point to, and I think that helps the conversation and to narrow that gap. The second gap, and all of you as students here will recognize this, there's an analytical gap. And this is what, an area where I would really hope we might be able to tap some of your intelligence and expertise. Um, when you get into these, so you get over the first hurdle, someone's seriously interested in the impact conversation, but we're limited in the analytical tools we put forward to actually go through the investment process. And what do I mean by that? In our deals, we're talking about total return. It's, we don't want to have what I just described as the pension fund or insurance company saying financial return first, impact second, or tertiary concern. We actually want to demonstrate at the same level the different returns and combine them that the investor will realize through the deal. So there is a social return, an environmental return, a developmental return, a financial return. We shouldn't hide the financial return. But it is a combination of returns that we're trying to put forth to allow someone to make the investment decision. And our analytical tools are limited in that regard. So we get into conversations very quickly about market, commercial return, market rate of return, benchmarks. Well, what we're doing in many of these deals, there is no market. These are first off deals. You're, in, you're proving a new business model. You're in a new geography. There is no comp. There is no benchmark. So how do we enable a well-intentioned investor who serious, is serious about deploying his or her capital, how do we enable them to go through the analytical rigor to get to yes? And I think we have some work to do there. Uh, we've done some work in that regard. Happy to talk about that a little bit further. But it is a gap. There isn't enough. And it's not just the language. It's the actual analytical instruments and tools to be able to do that. And then the third, which is a little bit of a segue into us, the third is there's a gap in the ecosystem. You've all probably seen the World Economic Forum ecosystem picture. I actually have it in my slides tonight as well. It's a very good just framing and orientation of the industry. We include, we are an advisory intermediary. So we're an intermediary. We do not have assets under management, so we're not a financial intermediary in that sense. We work with a lot of asset managers, we work with a lot of banks and investors and others, but we're an advisory intermediary. As Kathy said in her opening remarks, there are very few of us dedicated to impact. Everything we do, and I'll tell you about our roots in a minute, everything we do is impact. We don't do it on the side, we don't do it over here, we don't say it's 10% of our time, it's everything in our firm, and it has been for 25 years, so we're not newcomers to this. Uh, and what we see is a real dearth of professional intermediation in deal structuring, in deal negotiation, and deal execution. And when you take a half a step back and you think about mainstream finance, you know, advisors are in abundant supply for small companies, large companies, financial institutions. We should have the same expectation as our work becomes more professional and our industry professionalizes. And I, what, I, what I object to at times, I get quite concerned when I'm sitting in Nairobi or somewhere else and working with an entrepreneur who shared, shows me a Series A or Series B term sheet that he or she signed because the investor just said, well, this is, these are the terms of my money and that, that's just it. When A, it's the absolutely wrong instrument for the business. The entrepreneur did not understand what he or she signed. Um, and there's just a, there's a, an, an unlevel 
playing field here. I mean, there's not an appropriate coming together, and ultimately it's going to lead to some unhappiness, both from the investor point of view and the entrepreneur's point of view. And let's all remember here, the impact being generated is not being generated by the investor. The impact is being generated by the entrepreneur. We are all enablers, but the entrepreneur is generating and delivering, delivering that impact. And so I, I am concerned that we haven't fully developed the access to uh, intermediation. We've come up with several ideas how we can broaden that and also incubate uh, advisors in different locations because there are a number of accelerators, incubators, BDS providers, but that's really about investment readiness. Is an entrepreneur or a business ready to take third-party capital into that business? Are you moving to a stage where you really can negotiate debt, equity, guarantee, oftentimes layered combinations of capital with a promise to repay? Is the business at that stage in its life cycle? Can you, can you achieve that? Uh, and so I do think it's, it's, there's quite an important distinction in our work between investment readiness and transaction execution and preparation. And what I'm talking about, the dearth, is in the latter. There are a lot of good investment readiness providers doing technical assistance, capacity building. We do some of that in one part of our operation. But on the capital side, on the transaction structuring side, when helping an entrepreneur look at their business through the balance sheet lens, what does that balance sheet need to look like over time? There are not a lot of people doing that work. And I think if we really expect more transactions to come to fruition and be successful, we've got to attend to that. So that would be the third gap. So that's what we're seeing. I'd love in the course of questions or comments if people that resonates with what you're seeing in your own work and experience, or there are other gaps that you think are even more powerful and more compelling. I want to say a word about who we are and then given that, how we fit into this conversation. So the name is new, our work continues. Well, what does that mean? It means that we have been around for 25 years. We were founded by Shorebank Corporation, which was the oldest and largest community development financial institution in the United States. Uh, we then merged, as Kathy mentioned, with a company called Triodos Facet, which was set up by Triodos Bank in the Netherlands almost at the same time, 25 years ago. So both companies had been around for a long time and always working in this area. I should just make a mention that language does matter, and I'm delighted that impact has a lot of buzz and is attracting attention, but we shouldn't forget our history. There are many organizations and businesses out there who have been doing this work for decades. They may have been calling it something else. Shorebank, BRAC, Triodos, Calvert. There are lots of examples of, and, we, and I think it's important to at least be informed by our history. Language and, and new, I have a new name, so I, I get that. We change our names and we attract newcomers to the conversation or apply principles in new and different ways. But I do think our, our history is something we shouldn't lose. We are private sector consultants, so we are a business. We call ourselves a triple bottom line business because we were founded by Shorebank, which was a triple bottom line financial institution. And we challenge ourselves and have very uh, animated debates about what we mean uh, in the triple bottom line measurements, but that's core. So our shareholder, our board, management, we're all assessed and evaluated on a triple bottom line basis. Uh, we are advisors, so consultants, intermediaries, advisors, and I mentioned at the outset the inclusivity and sustainability aspect of our work. That is the focus, and that's the vet for everything that we do. Uh, we, we touch our direct clients, if you will, our financial institutions, operating businesses, and more. So sometimes they are platforms, and I'll give you a few examples of those, but we're not we're rarely, except when we're sitting and raising capital, on the actual consulting advisory side of the business, we're typically touching an intermediary, a bank, an asset manager, uh, a business, and not the consumer itself. The capacity plus capital is core to who we are as a consulting firm. So what we've learned over the years, and this goes back to, I would say, 20 years ago, there was a recognition that capital alone will not deliver the positive impact and the positive outcome. Capital alone will not solve that developmental, social, or environmental challenge. It just won't. The capacity constraints are oftentimes as severe as the capital constraint. 
So we, in our own business, we have two areas of focus, and really two businesses. We run it as one, but it's two businesses, two areas of staff and expertise, two areas of product service and delivery, which you'll see in a minute. But it's all grounded in this notion of you need both, the capacity plus the capital. On the capacity side of our business, our areas of focus, as I said at the beginning, about the inclusivity, inclusive finance, and that is absolutely how do you extend access to capital, information, and services to underserved entrepreneurs' households. Channels and linkages is primarily branchless and mobile, but it's not limited to that, but we do quite a bit in the branchless outreach areas. And sustainable business practices is looking at value chains, taking a very deep dive on value chains, and how do you make those value chains much more sustainable. I'll give you a couple of examples. On the capital advisory side, fundraising, how do you raise capital? So again, I said we're not an asset manager ourselves, but we are out there raising capital, sometimes for funds, sometimes for individual businesses. Mergers and acquisitions, this is a very interesting, I would say, area of growth in our business uh, through the lens of impact because a lot of the original microfinance funds have come to the end of their life cycle and they need to generate an exit to be able to return funding to the investors. And so we, in the past 18 months, have done four very interesting exit transactions. So we were on the sell side of those deals looking for a responsible exit. And what we mean by that is an appropriate acquirer of that stake to support the microfinance institution for its next stage of generation. And that's been a very interesting uh, development over the past 18 months. And then transaction-related services, that's actually doing due diligence, uh, investment servicing, and monitoring for investors who may not have feet on the ground in particular locations. So a couple of examples. Um, inclusive finance, EcoBank. EcoBank, very big bank in Africa, working in about 32 countries. So we were hired over a period of two years. So this is not a little fly in, fly out, give them a report and go away. It's actually rolling up our sleeves, embedding people in six countries in West Africa, working with EcoBank over two years to build a small business unit, the S of SME. They did a lot of underwriting to big corporates and to medium-sized enterprises, but not to the small enterprises. So that would be an example on the capacity side of the house of putting people in, most of the people are bankers, former bankers, operation processes people, risk management experts, and going in product design people, and going in. And just to give you an example of the, the need here, uh, Echo Bank, a terrific bank, and very committed to serving the underserved. When we walked in the door, they had 250 products, technically for SMEs. I and mean, the bankers didn't even know what they had. They, I mean, it was just, it was not effective at all, because they had grown through acquisition and merger, and so they really didn't have a sense of what the entrepreneur needed. When we left, they had five five products for the small business entrepreneurs and have gone forth to roll that out across the entire uh, organization. Uh, channels and linkages, branchless banking. So Bcash, an example of on the top left, is a joint venture between BRAC Bank and Money in Motion. Very interesting. It is a, uh, it's a subsidiary of a bank and what we would call a bank-led model. There's a big debate in branchless banking between telco-led or bank-led. At the end of the day, in my view, it doesn't really matter who leads because you have to have a financial services participation. It's, it is a financial product that we're ultimately trying to deliver. But there's, a, there's been a lot of, I would say, excitement about branchless banking. Very few of, of the global initiatives have achieved a point of viability, profitability, and scalability. It is a high volume, low margin business, so you need very big scale, and you need very deep pockets to actually get to that scale. Bcash is one of the successes, as is uh, Omni, UBL Omni, which is founded by the fifth largest bank in Pakistan. Very interesting work. Um, oh, on sustainable business practices, that's the, what I called about the uh, market linkages. So that's taking a very deep dive at a particular value chain, so the palm oil industry in Indonesia and looking very narrowly but very deeply through that entire value chain on how we can ensure the participation and inclusivity of the small holder farmers in that production. And then the capital advisory side. So this is where we do a lot of the fundraising work. We do the M&A work and the transaction. If I, oh, yes, please. Oh, good. Question. This sounds like a very interesting area to be in. Um, what's also interesting is it seems like most of your clients are the financial sponsors and you spoke very passionately about making sure you understand the entrepreneur, entrepreneur's needs and serving those first. So is there a tension there? 
great question, and the answer is no. There's no tension because our job, when we go into Echo Bank, for example, just take that, we choose to work with Echo Bank because we feel that ultimately, if we can help Echo Bank get the right products out into the marketplace, the reach will be incredibly impactful. So there, and looking at the role that the bank is going to play in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Cote d'Ivoire, it's a very important role in that community, but it's reaching more entrepreneurs. But how we do it is sitting with the entrepreneurs. So you can't design, when I talked about the five products, those five products were not designed sitting in a bank room. They were designed in the village, in the community, at the marketplace, listening and sitting. And I think one of the reasons we are hired is because we understand how to go into the community and work with the entrepreneurs because they have the needs the bank should be trying to serve. It's stunning how many banks we will go and work with and we say, well, let's just meet some of your clients. Oh, well, well we'd have to leave the bank to go to the, well, that, that is kind of the idea. So let's, <laughs> let's all get up and go into the market and let, let's go. But it is, it is quite surprising, even for well-intentioned financial institutions, that when you really talk about that S, that individual entrepreneur, there is a perception that, oh, I don't know how to talk to that entrepreneur, I don't know how to underwrite that risk, I don't know how to help them put their own financial house in order. And entrepreneurs, they know their business. They may not have audited financial statements, but they know their business. And that's exactly the role that we play. So it's not attention, it's, I would say, it's an outreach, and our job is to bridge that distance between the entrepreneur and the bank. Is that responsive? But basically you work with microfinance institutions in different ways, or? Echo Bank's a big commercial bank. But okay, but you are trying to perform it in microfinance, so the focus is microfinance or not new? No, 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 no. Finance, I think the trend, we do some with microfinance. Sure, we've worked with Mibanco and a, you know, a number of microfinance, Hasbank, a number you would probably know. But it, are the, the focus, our founder was not a microfinance institution. Our current investor, Triodos Bank, is a, a general commercial bank with a strong environmental focus and lens. So microfinance is important, certainly, but we're not limited to that. If anything, I would say the trend is that more and more commercial banks are seeing an opportunity to design appropriate products and services for that S, that small entrepreneur, which might have a business that frankly is a little bit too big in size and scale for the MFI to be servicing, even though we've seen a lot of MFIs also transforming into regulated deposit taking institutions. Nevertheless, there's still, there's different segments along that road of the micro to the small to the medium. And, and there's a whole wide range, and I would say a growing range now of financial institutions looking at that. I was just in Georgia last week, not this Georgia, um, next door, Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia, and uh, we, we invest in a, a non-bank finance company there that is uh, owned, majority owned by TBC Bank of Georgia. And that's a big commercial bank that now has invested in a microfinance institution as separate from its commercial bank, but aligned with the bank. So what we're seeing more and more of that in the inclusive finance agenda, and I think that's a positive, yeah? The, I use the microfinance in the MIV situation, those microfinance investment vehicles. There are a lot of them coming to that period of maturity, so on our M&A work, we're doing quite a bit in that area. But on the financial inclusion agenda, it's much bigger than that, yeah. Any other question on that? Good, thank you, but please, any, at any point, jump in. So on the capital advisory side, raising capital, uh, designing both at a fund level, so right now here, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, I did want to mention. This is very interesting. They're our client. They are a non-equity alliance of banks, microfinance, and other institutions. So Credit, uh, Credit Cooperative in France is a member, Van City in Canada. It is global, so you have some very large credit unions and cooperatives, as well as Ami Banco in Peru. They have come together committed to a set of principles that they call the principles of sustainable banking. They don't mean green banking. They mean the role of banks as providing support to the real economy in the, in the local communities that they serve. And so they've come together as a group and they design their own business outreach in accordance with those principles and they've asked us to consider how could we create an investment vehicle that would invest tier one, tier two regulated capital into banks like them, not limited to them, but to banks around the globe who have embraced this agenda 
in their own banking activities. So that would be at the larger size of, or it's a Luxembourg CCAF SIF, so it's a very complicated registered vehicle that would be at the larger end of the fundraising. And then at the smaller, to the point about entrepreneurs, we are raising a couple of million dollars for a small entrepreneur in East Africa who makes solar lanterns and to try to help them in their distribution of those products in East Africa. So there's a big range and we want to make sure that we're accessible to both, yes. So earlier you spoke about the messaging and one of the points you mentioned was um, oftentimes people will only look at impact after they've met the basic yeah. barriers. As you are moving towards that larger range of the spectrum, that is the message that draws the large multinational banks into the space. So how are you thinking about that and how are you thinking about trying to adjust your strategy so that they might become more familiar with a different message? It's a great question. It's a really great, we debate this actively around the table. So I think there are two parts, or maybe, maybe there are three parts. One is definitely know your audience. So you're right, N know your audience, do your homework in advance, and also be mindful of what language will resonate because you do have to connect with the person. You just, if you're gonna have any substantive comment, there has to be a connection. So you may have your own desire of language choice, but understand how that institution operates. So if it is a pension fund, be cognizant of how they're structured and the language that they use in their own internal meetings. That's just point one. But the real important point is, I, I don't think that what we wanna be doing is hiding the impact. I really don't. I don't. We don't want to, at the end of the day, sign on one of the investors, the profile you've alluded to, only on the terms that they see as fitting within their single bottom line investment criteria. I don't think that's being true to the mission first, mission last. I don't think that's baking in the totality of the return proposition that I spoke to at the beginning. So how you get there is through that analytical framing that I was talking about in the opening comments. Understanding and unpacking what do those return drivers look like for this transaction, but speaking to it in a way that is consistent with the language they would use. The third part though, which is the key, is then me measuring it. Because it's one thing to sell a deal using impact and using total return. It's another thing to then hold that deal accountable and actually show back to the investor what really happened and what's really happening as you've done so effectively in the case studies. So it's those three levels. It's yeah, I mean sometimes, so what I'm saying to you is that you have to be a little bit more flexible on the way in. But once you're in the room, once you're there, it's not hiding the impact in the conversation. Is it true that this, this transaction is going to be more palatable and it's gonna be an easier sell for an institutional investor than the Solar Lantern one? Absolutely, absolutely. But that's, that, in my view, that's okay if we get started there and, it's, and I'm still selling that transaction on the total return basis and embedding that in the terms of the deal. Yeah, here and here. You mentioned before that you help uh, small impact entrepreneurs to raise funds. We do, uh, I was there's a curious, big range. Yeah, yeah. I was curious, what are the most important needs that you find on those uh, entrepreneurs to raise their capital? In terms of the type of capital that they need, or? The, the help, the added value that you bring to them, what they need in this. Great question, great question. The, the biggest need that we see goes to the structuring point. So the typical, what will, the conversation will typically commence. We're, uh, when we're raising capital for individual businesses, we're, oft, we're oftentimes at that stage where they're seeking the expansion and growth capital. So the family and friends, the seed round, we might have been talking to them on a general information basis, but we weren't engaged as a professional service provider to assist them in closing that round of funds. So they've been at it for a little while with that initial funding. So we're getting involved at that stage of growth and expansion. What we find is that oftentimes the conversation will begin, I need $5 million. I need $7 million. Here's my business plan. And when we look at it and we start to really analyze it, that's not necessarily what they need, or if it is, they need it over a period of time, and then the instruments, what kind of capital do they need to actually fulfill the business? So I, the, the, what we've learned, and it's been a little bit of a, Kathy asked me to share lessons learned. For us, the lesson learned is that the time it takes to really unpack the business, structure the deal appropriately and properly. The company is investment ready, so not go back to what I said earlier, but even within that investment readiness context, that has been the biggest need. And I think also the biggest value that we bring to the entrepreneur. 
it's not just saying, okay, can you just put a private placement memorandum together or put the deck together and then go out to the market and sell the deal. It's the, it's the real analysis of what does this business need and what, that allows us to then price the capital appropriately. Because what I said earlier, the impact is coming from the business, not the investors. We better get the right type and price of capital to allow that entrepreneur <coughs> to fulfill the business objectives. And if it doesn't meet the total return expectation of, the, of one investor, go on to another one. But it's that part, the structuring which leads to the pricing and other aspects. You had a question? Yeah, I really admire the, the multilingual approach um, that both Dr. Clark talked about and you are talking about with um, having to manage some of those tensions with the investors and also with entrepreneurs. And you mentioned that earlier about going into the villages and learning from the actual entrepreneurs. And I just want to know, how, how do you, as, a, as an organization, manage those tensions? I mean, how, how do you help the, the bank, for instance, to be able to talk to the, the villages? Not so much in a in a language form, but just in a, how do we even come together to be able to understand one another? Yeah, it's a great, it's a really great question. Time. Mm -hmm. So again, we're not, uh, the, I will show you that we do work, we are, we do work all over, um, but not at one time in all these places. <laughs> That's not, and not, so, but we, we are global, but the answer is we, it's time and in-person time. That's the first thing, because you're right. We're, at the end of the day, it's creating that relationship between the parties that you've identified. And it's not just the bank and the entrepreneur, there are other, other parties oftentimes uh, involved in that conversation as well, but they're the two primary actors. The second thing, to be honest, for the bank, at the end of the day, if they don't see the business case, there's no point in talking to them. Because if they see this just as a CSR play or just as something they're doing to show they're good in the community, it won't stick. It just, it won't last. The products won't be there and the services for the entrepreneur over time. So we, in addition to learning how to talk to the entrepreneur, kind of demystifying the entrepreneur for the bank, um, we actually spend a lot of time on the business case for the bank, helping them really understand there is a market opportunity. This is a segment, a new segment for them, but there's a market opportunity here. Because if you don't have that buy-in and that business motivation, actually, it, it won't be successful. So that's very important. And okay. Well, I was, I was just going to say that it, it seems like you would have to help the actual entrepreneur be able to make the case because there's one thing coming from you I was as a consultant, yeah, exactly. but there's another thing coming from those. Do you help prepare? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And so oftentimes uh, the entrepreneur, we, we will sit with groups of entrepreneurs or we will work through BDS providers, business development support providers in a local community that we've identified and actually strengthen how they can help the entrepreneur prepare to go into the meeting with the banker. Right? We even do you know, role plays, what you, what you do in class. We do role plays. We take their financial statements, or if they don't have financial statements, we actually generate the financial statements. Sure. We prepare them. But we also are training the bankers to prepare those financial statements, trying to get them closer and closer and closer together. But implicit in your question is the, is the ap accurate observation. Both sides of the equation have to have additional skills and capacity and a willingness to come together. When it works, it's fantastic. But if, it's if we're only aff affecting the banks, it won't work. And if we're only touching the entrepreneur, it won't work either. So you're absolutely right. The supply and the demand side have to be attended to. And not to, to go off on a, on a tangent here, but that's one of the reasons why we merged with Triados Facet. So I, I just alluded to them, but I didn't describe the company. SBI historically worked with banks. We were founded by a bank. So although the lens was always the entrepreneur, the touch point was entering a bank to reach the entrepreneur. Triodos Facet was the opposite. Their touch point was the entrepreneur. They worked on the demand side. They had ownership also by a bank, Triodos Bank, but their experience, their orientation was how do we work with entrepreneurs and businesses directly or BDS and other service providers. So it was a very nice complementarity which got us quite excited that we could do better in the proposition you've just outlined. Uh, so I, I alluded to the, uh, to the geography. Um, and then I mentioned this. This is your World Economic Forum, picture that everyone's seen and where we, where we fit in that. And uh, this also is another cut at the industry. Um, just to give you size orientation, which I've alluded to. So on the, on the high end of the deals that we're seeing at the moment, 100, 150 million is the, the, the larger end of the scale. I would say, and then the smaller end of the scale, which we always want to be accessible for, is probably two to three million dollars in equity and five to ten million dollars in debt. So that gives you a sense of the size of the banks 
and the individual businesses, the entrepreneurs, were actually touching on the capital side of the equation. Um, I guess the, the final thing I would say, and then maybe Kathy will just have a, an open conversation, is that if there's a trend in what we're seeing, going back to what are we trying to solve for, environmental, social, and developmental challenges, it is a more holistic approach and a, more, a need for more complex solutions. And that's one of the reasons why we have our capacity and capital colleagues working side by side. Uh, and I just th I think this trend is not going away. I think it's here to stay. So an example was in South Africa, we were hired initially to look at a very specific issue uh, within a set of a group of South African banks. And if you know a little bit about or anything about South African banking, it's very sophisticated. These are big, sophisticated banks, uh, well-regulated, well-capitalized. So there was not a need uh, for the big ones. But they were not serving the needs of small entrepreneurs at all, at all. They just were not, they, they talked about doing a little bit through the CSR window, but they were not. A Little bit of micro, microfinance was slightly different, but small business entrepreneurs, they were not touching. So we were asked to come in and try to help figure that out. As we, so over here, financial institutions strengthening. What we figured out, of course, the products they were offering were not what the, what the entrepreneurs needed. These were not products that, that worked. They took their corporate product and put a purple wrapping on it and put it out there and said it's now their small business product. So we went to the product design and really focused on that through community engagement, working with entrepreneurs, mapping the businesses. Some of these businesses are seasonal, and these are cash flow based businesses. These are not asset oriented businesses, and that's the big departure that a bank has to make and get comfortable on, which is possible, but it is about looking at the cash flows of the businesses. So the product development, which led us to green growth, because what we looked at with a lot of these businesses, there was a very strong appetite and need within the businesses to finance the retooling of their operations to be more energy efficient. Uh, m they wanted to be tapping renewable energy and the like. So that allowed us to have a, a, quite a big focus in clean energy with the businesses themselves, which took us into a value chain approach, because then we were looking at how the bank could actually finance some of the providers of the clean energy Solutions. And the bank got quite excited about that because they could understand uh, that kind of uh, value chain uh, that, that made sense. There were some bigger businesses in that value chain and that, that made sense to them. Uh, we then built in the environmental and social management systems because the whole point about the alignment and then the accountability was to make sure that the bank was then looking at the results that they were achieving through this portfolio, not only from the financial point of view, but the environmental and social management system. And that is also where we got buy-in from the bank. They got excited that they could actually track this and see the results. Um, it did open a window on capital advisory because some of the businesses needed not only bank debt, but they needed other forms of capital. And the bank shouldn't get into the business of providing the venture capital and other types of capital these businesses might need. So we also started to create uh, small funding pools for some of the businesses. Um, and then we did tap some of the alternative distribution channels in ways to reach the small businesses, particularly outside of the main urban centers. But this, for, for our work every day of the week, wherever we are, whether it's in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Tbilisi, Georgia, we are seeing this complexity and this connectivity. So it's not just being hired for a narrow solution, a narrow set of issues. And even if somebody does hire you for that, it's the ability to actually carry that through and connect and draw upon different skills and services because that's the way you have the real, the real impact. So I think maybe I'll stop with that, Kathy. Sure. There's a yeah. 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 Maybe maybe just the, the last. I'll just very. I'll leave our little. This is our kind of vision and value slide. So for us, um, as I told you at the beginning, we are a triple bottom line organization. We were founded by a triple bottom line company way back when, and we were proud of that. We don't really use triple bottom line now. Again, changing language, modernizing language. We call it people, principles, and prosperity. And ultimately, at the end of the day, for us, it's it's grounded in this notion of principled prosperity. Uh, the idea that all can participate meaningfully in equitable, sustainable economies without unacceptable trade-offs between economic, social, and environmental outcomes. So that's really the philosophy of the, of the firm. Good. Questions? Yes, can you go back to the slide where you, where you saw the invest, different investment sizes? Um, 
I, I'm see, I see a problem with the, with the size of the sector and the, and some larger funds. Here? That, yes. <coughs> yeah. So you, you see banks like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, uh, and others. Duke <laughs> <Good> University. <laughs> <laughs> So they try to go into impact investments, but as you said, you have these entrepreneurs that are very small even to take some investment from other companies. So right. where do you see these kind of big banks making the investments and how is that different? Because from what I've read, they invest in public companies, uh, right. energy efficient. Right. So how does that differ from social responsible investments? Well, so a couple of questions embedded in, uh, that I'm going to tease out in your, in your question, and then uh, you, you can uh, come back. I, first of all, the role of the large financial institutions, which I think is at the, the top of your question. We reach out to the, the big investment banks in, I would say at the moment, in one particular area. We bring transactions to them that we think may be attractive to their private wealth clients. So remember I talked earlier about the gatekeepers and the advisors. The private wealth clientele of Credit Suisse, of UBS, of JP Morgan, absolutely, we believe those individuals are very interested in some of the transactions we are seeing in the industry and structuring. So we are a source of pipeline and origination. And we now are receiving a lot of outreach from those big banks say, saying, hey, can you come by and show me what you have? What kind of deals do you have even in your pipeline? Because I have now some clients who are very interested in clean energy, in ag, in education, in, in, in certain geographies. What do you have in that regard? And I think that's a welcome conversation and interaction. So we see them as our allies uh, source of capital in that area. I think in terms of uh, the actual investment banking service provision, I, I, where we'll see them play, of course, will be uh, if and when we get to the very large, the mega transactions. They will. They, will, they always have, and I'm sure that they will continue to look for that. We see it selectively, I would say, at the moment, in part because, to your question, what are the size of these transactions? The, the largest one that we're working on at the moment, it will be a $500 million transaction. So that would attract the interest of one of the bulge bracket investment banks. The client in that case really wants a firm that is more aligned with what they th see as their banking values as they put that deal together. But there'll be choice out there. So I see them participating in that regard. Obviously the research that comes out of the banks, and we've seen a lot of the good research that's coming out of the banks as well. But I don't, I, I, I can't envisage, I mean I can't speak for them, but I mean I used to work for for um, Solomon Brothers way back when. I can't imagine a day where they would take on that three or two or three million dollar uh, solar lantern transaction from a truck. I, I just can't imagine it. I can imagine that they would actually have some investors interested in participating in that deal. Yeah. But, but, but do you see a, a big space for this type of large investments uh, there, or will there, or how long do you think it will take for this type of 500 million transactions to be happening on an it's very hard to say. I think that we should also uh, not necessarily rush to just create size to serve the interests of institutional investors. I mean, when I gave the example earlier about pension funds and insurance companies, we know it's a slow cultivation for all kinds of reasons. We're in front of them because we want to be engaging in that conversation, not because we think tomorrow we're going to have three $500 million transactions. I mean, what I'm concerned a little bit about as we see more and more funds being created, at the end of the day, those funds have to deploy the capital in individual deals. So the last mile, which is where in some of our work, we see that last mile going from the fund into that solar lantern uh, business, they're still modest in capital requirements and modest in capital needs. And overcapitalizing these businesses can also be dangerous and not the right thing. So I think we should be walking before we run. And, and be, I, you're right to identify that as an issue. But I, I don't think it's slowing us down at the moment. I don't think it's slowing us down. And I think rushing too quickly towards that would actually cause some disruption that would not be good. I don't think we'd have the right foundation. Yeah. yeah. One, I guess, a group that you haven't discussed outside of financial institutions 
are corporations. So if you have, like in looking at industry alignment, so if you're looking at maybe a big energy company or, I mean, you talked yeah. about investigating the value chain in um, palm oil or something. Right. So have you worked with industry, like corporations who are looking to derive revenue streams, you know, I, you know yeah. changing the language, corporate responsibility, right. but really looking to derive yeah. revenue streams from investing in these yes. small entrepreneurs? Great, it's a great question. Yeah, so if you use the palm oil example, someone like a Unilever, right? And if you look at what Unilever has done, they, their CEO is very clear about sustainability as the central point of the business. Not over here, not a side window. He really is trying to embed it across the institution. So yes, we do, we do reach out and try to work directly with the corporates. Um, on the capacity side of the business, actually it's finding those solutions. They're coming to us sometimes and saying, we are involved in this industry, palm oil, fisheries in Ghana, um, the honeybee sector, whatever it is, and saying, can you help us figure out ways to be more participatory, more sustainable, as we go smaller and smaller and smaller and lower and lower into that small business participation in the value chain. So they, that's, that's a good sign that some of them are coming to us. And you're right, it's, but it's like the banks. It's through a business lens. They want to do it because it's core to their business. On the capital side, we are beginning to reach out to corporations for investment capital. That is more through the CSR. CSR slash, I would say, learning. So we've had some interesting interest from corporations in Asia who want to just get to know Cambodia. They're just interested in, they want to put a little toehold in Cambodia. So they may invest in a deal because they're going to get a look-see in, and they think from a reputational point of view, participating in an impact transaction will be a good thing for them. But, it's, but their real motivation is an exploration. And my... Uh, okay, because again, know that you also talk about this in some of your work, know the motivation and the interest. They're not, they're not denying any aspect of the transaction. They, they like it, but ultimately they're doing this as an exploration on the corporation side. But I think we should be doing more uh, to reach out to corporations. We're beginning to see it. So in the food, ag, uh, food, ag, and energy, I would say those, those, those three areas, and finance. Would you contrast the... Uh domestic market versus, I mean, you, you serve the international market, I assume, but the difference between that and the domestic market here in terms of the needs for the kinds of services that you provide. And also, um, spoke a lot about the transaction sizes that your clients are involved in, but can you give me a sense of the range of, and the, and the median of the, of the billings for your engagements when you deliver those types of services? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so on the need of the services, I, you know, it's interesting. I, historically, we, when we were part of the Shore Bank family, we worked primarily outside the United States. So since we came out of the Shore Bank family in January of 2011, we actually have been doing transactions in the United States and the United Kingdom. It was only just a historic reason that we were focused outside the U.S. So I have more limited exposure in what we're offering now in the U.S. Uh, because it's just been, it's more more recent. But I'll tell you, uh, I don't see a lot of people in the United States offering the kind of advisory intermediation on structuring and execution. So we have had several people come to us in the U.S. without marketing at all, saying we, we need help to find that real alignment of investment capital to our underlying business model and you have the structuring expertise. At the end of the day, no one is hiring us just because we're good structurers. There are tons of people out there who are good transaction professionals. So that's not the reason people would hire us. We are good, but people would hire us because we understand that alignment of expectations and interests. That's the, and we, we really try to focus on the business model itself. That's why people would hire us. So we've been pleasantly surprised at some of the outreach and the interest in the US and the UK. I can't give you order of magnitude. Is it more robust here than in other parts? So I just, I don't have enough data points, I think, to give you that. But I, it's not, I wouldn't say to you, it's as if there's no need in this country versus tremendous need in Europe or Sub-Saharan Africa. Who are some of the best in class peers of yours that serve the domestic market? I mean, I'm thinking about, I don't know, maybe people like Watershed Capital or something like that, but they're yeah. really small. Yeah. Um, Watershed, there are nimble players, I think um, Total Impact Advisors, um, they do a little bit in the U.S., uh, yeah, not, not many. I mean, we don't, bump up, we don't bump up against a lot of people doing it here in the United States, yeah? 
In terms of the revenue and the revenue, like MacArthur, you know, I mean, there's people within certain, like in community development, you know, what some of the PRI funders are, are sort of doing some of the structuring, even though. But, but yeah, no, that's a, very, that's a very good point. That's a very good point, Kathy. M MacArthur will, but they'll structure the deal and they'll bring others in but they're not doing it on a fee-for-service basis. Okay. But because they've been at it so long and they have a really deep expertise, that's a very good point. So on, on PRI-led deals, you have a number of very, I mean, Ford does that. The Ford team is excellent at structuring those deals, MacArthur, and then people piggyback on them. But I th it, as a third-party intermediation provider, right. there's a, I don't see a lot of some of that. Um, on, on fee size, there's a, it, it's a range, as you can imagine. I mean, to be candid with you, we, we try to price in accordance with what our clients can all, what's appropriate to our client businesses. Uh, it's, a, it's a typical retainer and success fee, corporate finance structure, but the retainer is, it's, it's, it's quite modest um, and depends on, again, size and complexity of the deal. I mean, it's, it's hard to give you a single number, uh, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not what we would, would charge if we were... Uh, at another institute. I mean, it's, it's relative to the business, yeah. And it, oh, and importantly, it's time limited. So we don't have retainers that go on and on and on. We have a time limitation. And then if the deal takes longer than that, that's uh, our exposure, our investment. I do have a personal view about this, though. Even though it's d very difficult for any client, and especially one delivering an extraordinary product and service early on in their stage of life, to come up with the funding to provide advisory services or to pay for advisory services. We won't do deals solely on success. And that's from my former life as well. I just think it creates a misalignment um, or has the danger to create a misalignment. And I want to always be able to say to the client, don't do this deal. This is not, th this deal is not in your best interest. And if I'm too exposed financially, um, as much as I think I would still do that, I don't want to be compromised in the objectivity of the advice that we give. So as a, as a rule, it can be a very modest retainer, but there is something, there is a financial engagement with the client. I do think that's really important. Let's do one more question. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned that uh, in clouds focus not just on the financial the return and more like on uh, the total returns. I'm wondering how you actually structure the formula of the total returns and then the t you actually have the, some standards formula that applies to most of the case where you actually, it's different case like that. Oh, it's back here. It's, it's a, a, such a good question. And uh, so for our work, so for our work, I mean, this is just a snapshot, but we do you know, challenge ourselves to keep track of, so what are we doing? What value are we adding here, right, for our work? Um, and there's, it's not formulaic. We do have a very good, as part of the merger, we have a very good set of colleagues based in Zeist in the Netherlands who have a deep and much deeper expertise than any of us at SBI had in outcomes measurement. And so they've been adding quite a bit of value to us over these past few months. We just merged this year in trying to help us deepen our understanding. It, but it, I wouldn't say it's, it's formulaic. It, that, that's, because I think when you get into the formula, sometimes we miss, we miss the plot. Um, I would say the second thing that I've learned about outcomes measurement is that we should be measuring five, not 55 things. I think although uh, there's lots of good work on taxonomy and consistency of language, which I think should be celebrated and utilized by all of us, at the end of the day, what you are really tracking should relate to your working hypothesis of the change your business will have. What's the change, what's the delta that your business is going to generate? And you should be able to check that, to, to monitor that, to evaluate that on a handful of indicators, not 55 indicators, because then again, we kind of dilute it and, and, and lose the plot, yeah? So I'm and I'm happy to follow up with you on that, because it's really interesting. I'm really asking the last question, which is not actually, actually mine, it's from your colleague. Oh, <laughs> so uh, she noted that you keynoted uh, in 2011 the SRI and the Rockies conference, yeah. talking about what you thought the next uh, five years would look like for social entrepreneurship and impact investing. Yeah. How the last two been, and how do you think the next, uh, how do you think it will unfold over the next five? Gosh. Were you right? Yeah. So, um, oh, oh. In, in, in some ways, I, I just reread that speech actually before coming here, which I think is why she, she wrote that question. Um, but you can say whatever you want because none of us have read it. I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> I did, yeah, so I, I talked about, I did, just to, to, it, it's appropriate for the answer, I talked about the supply side and the demand side and measurements, if we're really talking about moving the needle, right? So the, the, the supply side from the investor point of view, are investors going to move beyond 
a flirtation or an articulation of interest and really put capital to work. I think there has certainly been a galvanizing embracement of the, the, the notion of impact. So we've moved in that regard. But as I said in the opening, I think the conversion of that into really putting money to work has been more limited than I would have expected. And where I've been, some, some incredible successes have been some enlightened investors who have said, look, I'm still trying to figure out how this will overall affect my portfolio across the board because I believe it's an approach, not an asset class, and it's an approach. But for the moment, I'm going to make an allocation. I'm going to say X amount of dollars in my total portfolio, I'm going to put under the big impact umbrella, and then I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to look within that portfolio. So you know, somebody like a Christian Super out of Australia, they've done that very thoughtfully, not because they believe it's a separate asset class, but it's a tool for them to actually take the next step. So I, yes, there's been progress, uh, not enough, to be honest, from the investor side. And I think we're still, we need to see the conversion from articulation into action, and especially deals that are priced appropriately and structured appropriately for the business. On the demand side, there are a lot more choices. I mean, all the cases that the asset managers and the funds that you've shown, and more and more funds under development, lots of funds in the market now, lots and more and more and more funds using the impact umbrella. Again, I think we should be careful so that impact doesn't become just the buzzword, but actually means something. And then you, when you get the question from an investor, so what is the, what's the investment thesis here? What problem are you solving with this capital? There should be a smart an, an answer that is then measurable in the course of the deal. And I think we have more work to do there. And the second part on the demand side, I am still worried about the last mile, because with all these funds being created, if you go back and check on some of them that were created a year ago, the deployment of capital out of those funds, it's a trickle. It's a trickle. So we, we, we do have some work at the last mile. And if we overhype the aggregation, to your point, oh, this is a $500 million deal, so then people can come in. Well, we still have to, we have to deploy that capital. And that there's a bit of a concern there. And then the third um, thing I spoke about, impact measurement. And I think we've made progress on the language and the notion that it's important, it matters. It's not just something you do here and it's a report and you put it on a shelf. So I think the awareness that it matters and it does hold you accountable is there. And I think a language is there, but I think what remains is how do you apply that? How do you actually choose those five indicators to demonstrate are you on track for your working hypothesis about the change in the business? That's I think the real, that's the hardest work and that's the work that has yet to be done. But having said all of that, I think we're on track to solve those three things. I mean, I do. I, I think the trend and the momentum is there. I mean, the, obviously the work that you've been doing, the support you've been gaining, and the attention that is out there in the broader community, I think suggests that we're on track to, to get smarter and harder. You framed it nicely. It's, not, it's no longer about whether we should be engaged in these activities. It's how do we do them better and more effectively. So the conversation has shifted. It's no longer aspirational. It's now about execution. And I think that's, that's and I think that's significant. Yeah. Please join me in. Thank you. Thank you.